The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Okay, so next uh, we will have Mike Warner uh, from JPL, who is the Chief Scientist for Astronomy and Physics, and uh, his scientific expertise is quite broad, uh, uh, focusing uh, uh, mainly on infrared astronomy, but applying uh, across uh, various astrophysical applications. Uh, of note is that uh, he's been um, project scientist for the Spitzer mission uh, since the uh, about 1984, I believe. That's correct. Uh, still a productive mission. And uh, he's going to talk to us today. Uh, we'll have the, we give an equal time to um, earth science, planetary science, and astrophysics, but the astrophysics part will come in, in two pieces. Uh, Mike Warner and then uh, Paul Goldsmith will, will follow, and they're both talking about uh, applications of airships to astrophysics. Thank, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Like many people around here, I wear many hats or many shirts. And I'm particularly proud today to be wearing my Keck shirt because I'm a member of the Keck uh, Institute Steering Committee. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some astrophysical applications of airships. The ground rules is I'll be confining this discussion to 0.3 to 5 microns. Paul will pick up around 60 microns when we left a little wavelength gap there. This is no attempt or pretense at being comprehensive. And some science examples from my own experience and from some uh, things we've been doing at JPL recently. Um, I should also say that, um, let me just get started, um, probably the hottest topic in astrophysics these days is exoplanets. Uh, the aspects of that I'll be talking about dovetail nicely with what Jeff talked about. And bear in mind, for those of you who aren't um, aficionados of this subject, that a lot of what we know about exoplanets comes from the fact that there are so many of them that a goodly number are transiting, are going in front of, and then behind the star that they're orbiting. And so when they go in front of the, of the uh, star, you get information about the size of the planet. When they go behind the star, many of the planets are bright enough in the infrared that when they go behind the star, there's a drop in the infrared radiation from the system. So you're, you're able to see, by subtraction, basically, the infrared radiation from the planet, even though you don't separately see the planet. So there are lots of interesting things one can learn about exoplanets. One of the uh, things that's been discovered by the Kepler mission, which has studied many exoplanets, is that often there are several such planets in a system, and because of their mutual perturbations, there's a jitter in the timing of the transits, which is due to the fact that the planets are tugging on each other as, the, as they go around the star. And so one of the things one could study with our airship telescope is these transit timing variations. It's a good way to determine planetary masses if the parent star is too faint for the radial velocity confirmation, which one would like to have. This is a simulation by Eric Agall of timing variations for a couple of recently discovered uh, planets uh, called trans Kepler 62 E and F. You can see here that this is for a 2.4 meter telescope, a five Earth mass is the assumed mass of each planet. There's a long time baseline here of many years and there's a jitter in the timing of plus or minus about five minutes in time as these planets pull on one another as they go around the, uh, the star. I'll, I later have a summary of the kind of requirements of these various science stories. Another uh, thing one can do with uh, transiting planets is use the transits as a means of studying the atmosphere of the planet. And this is uh, led to the field of character, characterization of exiting exoplanets, which, of course, is the step beyond actually discovering them. When the planet goes in front of the star, the depth of the transit depends critically on what the structure of the of what's in the atmosphere of the planet. If there's an absorbing molecule at a particular wavelength, it makes the planet look just a little bit bigger, and the transit is just a little bit deeper. And one can measure with very high precision what the depth of a transit is. This is some wonderful data from Spitzer, which is about 23 of these uh, transits put back to get put together, measuring the uh, thickness of the radius of the planet with an uncertainty of about 50 kilometers. 
which is about the uh, thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. You can see how doing this with a spectrograph at different wavelengths, you can study the molecular composition of the planet when it's moving in front of the star. When it goes behind the star and you see the um, drop in the infrared emission from the system, again, the uh, signal, if you're doing it with a spectrograph at successive wavelengths, you can get information about the uh, composition of the planetary atmosphere from here. This is some work by my colleague at JPL, Mark Swain. And to do this well, you need something, wavelengths for the emission part, from what, which is where the interesting molecules are seen for the most part. You want to go from one to, to three microns and preferably to five microns, at least a one meter class telescope, good pointing, and as Jeff pointed out, high precision, because the depths, the, the, the size of these uh, effects due to the size of the planet are not tremendously large. Even though this looks very deep, it's probably considerably less than a 1% effect. Zero is down there in the basement someplace. Okay. Another interesting thing one might do with your uh, uh, airship telescope is to study weak lensing, which is a subtle distortion of the shapes of galaxies due to intervening dark and luminous matter along the line of sight. Uh, fortunately, Jason Rhodes, who's one of the organizers of this workshop, is a leading weak lensing expert. So if I get the story wrong, he can straighten you out later. I found this picture on the web. I think it's just wonderful. And basically, the idea here is your galaxies are, are, are round when, they, when the light leaves them, and they get distorted into little ellipses when the light gets to us by all this intervening stuff. Okay. This is an important way to study dark matter and dark energy, uh, a mysterious but important constituents of the universe. There are major missions to study these phenomena, but none of these will launch before 2020. There are ground-based projects, but the observations uh, could be extended from a, a telescope on an airship. It would have to have, uh, it could have an important niche in weak lensing, stu weak lensing studies. It would require a wide field of view excellent stable images and moderate aperture. That's what you could, would need to study weak lensing. Uh, you could also look to study debris disks, which are extremely interesting structures, which are um, byproducts of the presence of, of exoplanets around, of planets around other stars. The planets are accompanied by asteroids and comets, and the asteroids and comets, in turn, are creating dust analogous to the, the zodiacal dust, which is the dust cloud that our own sun, that our Earth runs around in, and the Kuiper dust cloud, which we think is out beyond the orbit of Neptune in our own solar system. These uh, dust clouds, which were discovered actually by the IRAS satellite before any exoplanets were found, were for many years the best indicator of extrasolar planetary systems because of the fact that the dust is short-lived and therefore has to be replenished. And so people realize the only way to replenish it is with asteroids and comets, which are at least indicators of planetary system formation. Um, the dust, debris disks are markers of planetary system formation and evolution, and their structure and geometry may hold clues to the character of the planetary system in which they, uh, in which they live. And so they're actually since they're big and, and, and uh, uh, extended, you can imagine imaging them in systems where you couldn't actually see or image the exoplanets. So this imaging could be done with what's called a coronagraph, which is an instrument you place behind a telescope, which basically blots out the light from the parent star through a series of, um, of, uh, of re-imaging optics and masks and, and so forth. Uh, it places constraints on the image quality and stability of your system, and your object, objective is to get a contrast which is uh, less than, let's see, it's, it's, it's better than 10 to the minus 7, okay? So the contrast is the ratio of the uh, residual starlight at the place where you're looking to the actual brightness of the star itself. So you have to suppress that significantly in order to see the... Um, uh, the disk, and we'd be looking at in the disk in scattered light, as has been done here in a few cases for Hubble, but Hubble does not have a very effective coronagraph, uh, it, although it is able, obviously, to do some work of this type. Another thing one could do with our putative telescope on, the, on our airship is a 
uh, systematic program of spectroscopy for one to five microns, exploiting the fact that we'd be above the Earth's atmosphere, or a good part of it, and parts of the uh, spectrum that don't normally get through would be, would be accessible to us. There are a very wide variety of science themes you could study. Ices in, cir around, uh, in cir circumstellar ices in, in around forming stars, Jeff touched on this, these various deep absorptions due to water vapor. It's carbon, carbon dioxide, which might be hard to do, but the ice feature might be broader than the atmospheric absorption uh, residual above you and so forth. Uh, all of these molecules that you want to study are the ones which are the most abundant in Earth's atmosphere. So there's a high priority of getting above some or all of it to look at these interstellar ices. You could look at brown dwarfs. These are actually emission spectra of cool brown dwarfs where at certain wavelengths you're able to look between the molecular bands down into the warmer regions of the brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is a star which never got quite hot enough to actually ignite nuclear burning but you can see it because of the residual heat uh, of formation. Um, Jeff, talk, I talked earlier about debris disks. There are at least a few which have enough warm dust that you could see that in the one to five micron region. You can study uh, interstellar hydrocarbons. We now know that there are a lot of very interesting hydrocarbon species in interstellar space. The so-called uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which have a important emission feature around 3.3 microns and some uh, uh, what are called aliphatic uh, systems which are uh, chains instead of rings which also radiate in the three to f 1 to 5 micron region. And there are lots of interesting gas phase emission lines. This is just a piece of the Orion spectrum with, with both atomic hydrogen and molecular hydrogen seen in it. Okay. So, this is a, a region that's very rich in spectral features and diagnostics. Spitzer had no spectral, spectroscopic capability below 5 microns. So this, although ISO did, it uh, had a rather limited uh, lifetime. And so there's lots that can be done here. A modest telescope in a survey or pointed mode could do great stuff. Uh, and you could extend this out to 10 microns. This whole region is made accessible now by the advent of the mercad telluride detectors that have been developed at uh, Raytheon and are being optimized for use, use at, uh, on JWST, James Webb Space Telescope. There's some work recently on extending that technology out to 10 microns, which is very promising and would be a real uh, ideal detector choice if you want to do this spectral band from our airship because it doesn't require helium cooling. It might even be cooled by... Uh, cooled totally passively, if that's possible. Yeah? I'm sorry? I'll, sh I'll tell you, and I'll show you in a second, okay. I, I'm not, nothing I'm talking about requires more than two meters, okay. So, but, so one to, one to two meters is kind of the answer. I mean, actually, we, you, can do, you can do interesting things here with an even smaller telescope. So what we, one of the things we need here in infra, in, for the infrared work is what I have called a site survey, because we don't quite know how conducive our airship will be to doing work in the infrared. So here's a kind of a summary of the capabilities required for the science cases I talked about, going from transit timing to the spectroscopic survey I just discussed. Some of them are happy in the visible. Some require being in the infrared, out to five microns or so. Apertures, uh, if you want to do transit timing in the Kepler field, you probably want to be where the stars are relatively faint, out around two meters. Uh, others, one meter or one meter class would do. For your spectroscopy, actually, a half a, half a meter would be pretty interesting. Um, in some cases, you need very good uh, pointing and image quality. Other cases, it's not so critical. And uh, various other things you might need, timing, long time baseline, uh, photometric precision, uh, high, high-ish high angular resolution, and, and so forth. Now, um, only there's much to be done in this area, and of these science cases, only weak lensing is specifically addressed by a dedicated mission at present, although all would merit one. So I think an important thing to think about, in my judgment, is not, I don't think you want to think about a multi-purpose observatory to fly on this spaceship, that would, on this airship. That would be kind of redundant. I think you're much better off thinking about something which has got a sharp 
science focus. So you could optimize it for the science project that you want to do, and then maybe it could do something else a little bit, and then maybe you'd have another optimized telescope or system for your next science story. So here's some things I didn't really talk about. Uh, interferometry, you can imagine if the airship is big enough doing interferometry, you have two telescopes. But that would have to compete with the LBTI, which has got two 8.4 meter telescopes with a 22 meter spacing. So I'm not sure how much better than you could really do with, the, with that on your spaceship. You could think about astrometry, astrometry, you have to compete with Gaia, which is an all, astrometry is measuring stellar precisions very precisely, Gaia is an all sky astrometric mission. You could think about wavelengths greater than five microns. That would be yet more substantial detector, cool, detector uh, cooling and technology requirements. To do well at five microns, you have to certainly get down into the 70 Kelvin or below range to suppress the dark current uh, on your uh, uh, Mercat telluride detector. And the longer your wavelength region, region, the lower the temperature you need to get to although mechanical coolers might do the job. You could do purposeful large area surveys uh, for the uh, Euclid and w, su supplementing Euclid and W first. And you could also think about a transient, an observatory optimized for the study of transients, which is a very uh, topical theme in astrophysics these days. Suggestions for future work. Well, I had the idea, just for the fun of it, that you could consider a telescope like the Arecibo dish or the Hobby Everly Telescope in Texas, where the telescope itself is fixed and the instruments move around at the focus of the telescope. So you could build your telescope into the upper surface of your airship, and then you could just have a small instrument package that moved around at the focus. I think we need a site, what I call a site survey for the infrared. I think we should ask Steve to redo his calculations to look at the emission and brightness of the sky as well as the absorption, that may be difficult to do because it depends a lot on the wings of the lines, which are uncertain, but that's what's going to determine that. You want to know what the telescope temperature might be without active cooling and so forth. And this will determine your competitiveness with ground facilities. And once you've done that, then you can think about matching your detector and temperature needs to the actual sky background. I did look a little bit at the impact of the thermal background I normalize this all the Spitzer, which is something I know something about. So compared to our airship, the signal noise from the airship is going to be, since Spitzer is 50 times more sensitive than the 8-meter eight, eight Gemini telescope, I put that factor in here. The signal noise from the airship will be 1 50th uh, times the diameter of the airship telescope divided by the 8 meters of the Gemini telescope squared times uh, a factor which depends on the square, the square, the sky brightness. Okay, and so in order to get your airship telescope competitive in raw sensitivity with Spitzer, or with a similar small radiatively cooled telescope that doesn't exist yet but might, you need to get the sky brightness at the airship, and that's a, tele a combination of the atmospheric emission, the telescope emission, the instrument emission about 10 to the fourth times lower than it is on the ground. It strikes me that that might be a, a major challenge. Yeah? Uh, I'm missing it. Did you say what you were assuming the temperature of your optics are in, in airship? No, I'm not. I have no idea what it is. OK, I'm saying we need to understand that. But uh, it's a combination of the temperature and the emissivity, of course, that determines the, the sky brightness. Compared to the ground, however, you can take out your factor of 50 and then a reasonable sized telescope might achieve comparable sensitivity to the large ground-based telescope if the brightness reduction is merely a factor of 100. Now, I think I did those numbers right, but since I'm I, uh, not infinitely, I think that's right. So somebody might want to check this if you actually want to act on it. But, but the point is that, that even if the brightness of the sky is uh, a tenth, is 1% of the brightness, um, it's, it's the square root of the sky brightness which produces the noise. And so a big a, a factor of 100 in sky brightness is only a factor of 10 reduction in noise. I think that's right. Um, so I'm asserting here that a reasonable size telescope, the, the sensitivity, in addition to the sensitivity achieved by the WISE survey, which is an all-sky survey in the infrared, is about equal to that achievable 
in one hour by Gemini. So I don't think that the comparative advantage of our airship telescope in the thermal infrared would lie in its ability to do surveys. Yeah? Sure. Oh, yeah. In the, in the optical, it's very different, Rich. I agree. Okay. But I think in the infrared, you know, one's first thought is always to do a survey. I don't think that's what you should think about in the infrared for this telescope that we're talking about. Okay. So what are the conclusions? Numerous optical infrared projects in the balloon and small explorer class, that's where these examples are from. Jeff Booth, I guess you'll be here all week, is is an expert on that from our group up at JPL, and he can help out with the details of the experiments I'm talking about if it becomes an issue. Telescope apertures, well, I would say is, is, is between 0.5 and 2 meters, but telescope apertures greater than 1 meter and wavelengths out to 5 meters provide, enlarge the uh, phase space for what can be done in a very substantial way. Pointing performance and image quality will be drivers for many, but not all of the applications. A sky survey to quantify background and thermal considerations for infrared payloads would be very helpful. I meant a site survey. It's a kind of a, of a um, conceptual thing. It seems to me that a scientifically targeted mission or a series of missions would be more sensible and more saleable than a general purpose observatory. We already have lots of general purpose observatories. In addition, if you want to keep the cost down, one of the ways you do it is to target the science. So, to me, and I hope this is right, if the price is right, whatever that means, but Randy made the same point, a fleet of airship-based observatories could be an interesting alternative to suborbital or even SMEX missions within the NASA portfolio. Thank you. <laughs>